love you this morning, Lord. Is he not worthy of your praise? I have heard it said this way, that tithing and giving offerings is just like a fat man that has to eat and breathe air. It's just something we have to do. I'm just telling you, I know that's in the Bible somewhere. We had cinnamon rolls in our class this morning and I, I was just fellowshipping with someone and he just told me, you know, the tithe for me is something I have to do every week because I just believe that God is that trustworthy. I thought that was better than what I just, anyway. God is that trustworthy, amen? We're gonna worship him with our giving this morning. And I just want you to not eat. I don't want you to breathe. I don't want you to stop doing either one of those or start doing one of those where you're at. Please don't start eating in the pew. But we want to give you an opportunity to give this morning as a worship unto God. How many of you believe God is trustworthy? Now some people will agree with me. I'm glad to hear that. Because I was going to stand right here and preach on tithing until I got some more amens. I had permission. No, I'm just kidding. No, that, I took too much. Too much. This morning, let's worship God with our giving. Let's give like we love Jesus. Amen. Father, today, thank you for the gifts in our lives, God. You have encouraged us, Father, to be good stewards over everything you have given us. So, Father, this morning, we provide the chance and the opportunity for everyone to be a good steward. Father, I believe that the faithfulness of your heart is transformed through the lives of your children when they are, give, they are, they are giving out of faithfulness unto you. God, let it be today that, Father, you would bless the gift and the giver and that, God, you would give the increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give this morning as a worship unto God. And his train fills the temple. I see the Lord, he is high and lifted up. I see the Lord, and his train. I see the Lord, He is high and lifted up. And angels cry, holy, holy is the Lord. And angels cry.
the angels, Father, proclaiming you're holy and worthy and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe. Yes, we can see the 
wonders are still what you do for bodies are still being raised and giants are still being slain God we believe and yes we can see that wonders are still what you do we are here for
that's you this morning, I don't want you to hesitate. I don't want you to think twice, but I want you to make a move to the front of this church. And as our prayer team comes, we're going to join with you. We're going to bind here on earth and bind in heaven. Breakthrough this morning that needs to be accomplished through the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So prayer team, come. And as we continue to sing this morning, we pray that God's going to move upon your behalf, on your family this morning, upon that need that you have. Oh, we need a move. someone pray with you this morning take your burden to the Lord we'll hold one another up in prayer this morning agree bind on earth be bound in heaven where two or three are gathered this morning come on Far away. 
Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, this morning that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So God, let your joy, let the rejoicing of our heart be lifted heavenward. For God, you have redeemed us and rescued us. You have called us to be your sons and be your daughters. And you have given us all things that pertain to life and living. And may we walk in that abundance of strength that abundance of peace for we know that greater is he that's within us than he that is in the world and we are more than conquerors through him that loved us praise God would you give our Lord and Savior a standing ovation of praise because he alone is worthy this morning hallelujah yes God Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Would you bless him this morning? O Thou art exalted far above all gods. Yes, you are. For Thou, O Lord, high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all God. Lift your hearts, lift your hands and bless his name. your praise to God this morning. Hallelujah. I love you, my Lord and my Savior. You are the strength of my life, the joy of my song. You are the light in my darkness and the lily in my valley. And I bless that name. <laughs> I, I bless that name that is above every name. That name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of, of our Father, hallelujah. We lift up and magnify that name for there is salvation and there is healing and there is deliverance in that name. Praise God. Praise God. 
Praise the Lord. Anybody in the house love him more than life? Say amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You may be reseated. Would you give it up for our team this morning that has led us in the presence of God? Bless you. Amen. It's great to be here on this Lord's Day and to worship and magnify the King of glory. Amen? Amen. 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 If you're saved and you know it, say, Amen. Amen. The person that's sitting next to you is saved and you know it, say, Amen. Ah, a little weaker. I've got a job to do this morning. Amen. Praise Lord. To our guests, we are delighted to have you here. By Facebook, we average over 500 people that log in every Sunday. And so we welcome you. We pray God's blessing upon you as well. And uh, just delighted to, to be in the house of the Lord. Thankful that he is here. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, he has promised, I'll be there. And he makes all of the difference. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We are delighted to have my sister and her husband, Al, and their granddaughter, Addison, in service with us. And it's always great to have big givers in the house. <laughs> and we love, we love our family, and they're from Russellville, Arkansas. And so if you're ever going down I-40 and, and you need a meal, I've got their number. Just let me know. And they, they attend a, an AG church there in Russellville, Bethel. And, and so we are, are grateful to have you guys in service with us. Amen. Amen. Well, turn to someone close. You say, mm -mm, you're looking good today. Brag on somebody. Come on. Now, how many had to stretch the truth? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Amen. Praise God. Before we get in the word, I've, I've got just a little housekeeping that I want to do. And, and uh, um, before God opens our heart to, to that which he's been um, so powerfully revealing to us and entitled Crossing Over Revisited. But um, first of all, I, I want to thank, special thanks to our leadership team and, and our board and you um, for your patience and support for Vic and I over these last, say, 19 months since the stroke. Um, we were out of the pulpit for almost five months and um, uh, you remain faithful, and we appreciate that loyalty, not just to our leadership, but to our Lord. Listen, our commitment can never be just to a man or an organization. Our commitment must be to Christ and Christ alone, for he is our only Savior. Amen? And so I want to thank you for that. And having said that, um, I want you to know that um, these last months have... Um, presented some adjustments and challenges for us physically. Um, I've always been off mentally, so that hasn't been any different, but some of, some of the physical challenges, sometimes the emotional challenges, I cry at the weirdest times, like, you know, I break out in tears when I order a Big Mac. Um, it's, it's really odd. And then when I should cry, I can't, like at funerals, you know, like, yeah, well, good luck with that. So, you know, it's just... <laughs> It's, it's, it's a little weird. Of course, you know, we're, we're, we're all weird in some way or the other. If you think you're normal, <laughs> what is normal, right? Um, but it, is, it has been kind of a challenge over these last few months. Um, your prayers have, have been priceless to us. But with the board's blessing, they have extended to Vic and I a 30-day sabbatical just to go and refresh and refuel and uh, so we're going to be out of the pulpit and out of town for the, for the month of October. And um, we miss you. We're going to miss you terribly. Um, uh, you're our family. We're making the trip together. But I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to step away and just kind of focus on our health. And, um, and Vicki probably needs a break. She told me the day, she said, I'm ready for you to eat well because I'm tired of raising of the toddler. And so uh, I'm in the toddler status, status now. So I'm looking for adolescents to show up soon, sooner than later. Um, but I want you to know that we have, we have a great pastoral staff, preaching uh, staff, and a deep bench, and you'll be blessed. One of my greatest 
concerns was, Lord, you know, you're doing so many things right now, and there's such great momentum, and we're just, we seem like we're in rhythm with the Spirit, and I don't want to step aside, and, and, and I, I don't want that to, to be endangered in any way. And the Lord just had a way, you know, he has a way of speaking to us and kind of being really honest with us. And he said, you know, this isn't your church. Um, last time I checked, this belongs to me. And so I was like, okay, I, I get it. I get it. And uh, so, uh, but what was really kind of cool how God took a little pressure off my mind was one evening late around three o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. And so I went and, and sat in the recliner, just uh, relaxing there. And, and the Lord really spoke to me and said, I want you to look up um, the latest by Jim Cimbala, which is the pastor of Brooklyn Tab there in Brooklyn. And, um, and so I looked up just to see if he had any new material out. And he had just written a book entitled The Church That God Blesses. So I pulled it up there on my iPad about three o'clock in the morning, began to read uh, the foreword in the first chapter, and second chapter, and third chapter. And it was, it was, it was so amazing how that uh, you could have taken that book and just fit it right into the DNA of Bethesda as far as where we're at and where we're going. And the Lord, I believe, spoke to me and said, I want you just to um, spin off of this, springboard off of this, the church that God blesses. How many wants to be a part of the church that God blesses? Amen. So it's like he gave me some consolation. It's okay, but if you still have to worry, I've got, I've got a direction already for the next 30 days. And so uh, if you have any questions concerning anything, um, ministerial-wise, minister church-wise, feel free to call the office. Um, Kay, Pastor Josh, Pastor Michael, uh, Pastor Mikhail, all of those are at your disposal. Our board is at your, at your disposal as well. And so... Uh, I, just, I just would pray that, that you, would, you would not forget us. And just because we're going to be gone for the next 30 days, that you, we just pray you won't take our picture off the refrigerator and throw it in the trash. Uh, we will be back. And, uh, but we, we certainly are going to miss Bethesda. But believing that God has, has some very special things in store. Amen? Amen? So I firmly expected that when I announced that, that you want to have a Jericho march. Um, so thank you for not having a Jericho march. I, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. And we want to get into the word this morning. Uh, God has given me a, a very definite word for us as we are in this journey of crossing over in regard to the crossing over that Israel, that Joshua generation experienced thousands of years ago crossing over from their wilderness, which was not their, their divine destiny, but believing for the promises of God, the land of promises, Israel, in which they still occupy and inhabit to this very day. There are some tremendous spiritual symbolisms and truth in that because we have become, by reason of, of spiritual birth, we have become a spiritual Israel. And we are the family of God, the children of God. And so, so some of those same truths and stories um, can relate to us in 2019. So I have been very excited about what the Spirit of God has been doing. Uh, we sat in our leadership meeting this morning, um, a little before eight, and one of the, one of the guys said, um, are, you gonna, are you gonna wrap this up and tie a bow? And I said, well, I... I, I still have more. <laughs> and so he said, Pastor, or he said, he said, Father, please let us cross over. <laughs> Just let us cross over in peace. But, um, but we are, we're moving in the direction. And I do believe that God is positioning us, positioning us for that uh, divine outpouring and revelation that he, he desires for all of his children to walk in. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. How, how many wants to be free in him this morning? Amen. Amen. All the chains broken, walking in total freedom because of the Son of God that has died for us and rose again for us. Amen. So how many believe in this house that your best is yet to come? Yes. Or do you think you've already tapped God out? I believe, I believe 
the best is yet to come. I truly believe that. I truly believe before the coming of the Lord that the church, not every, not religion, but the church of Jesus Christ will once again return to the basics of our faith and that we will walk in the authority that the blood of Christ has given us and that we will once again in America lay hands on the sick and they recover and miracles will happen and the prodigals will return to the father's house. I do believe that. I do believe the best is yet to come, that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. If I had to believe that we had reached our pinnacle in God and it was all downhill from there, it'd be difficult for me to press toward him any anymore. But to know in my heart that there is more, I continue to press for more. Amen. I still believe his second verse is always sweeter than his first. Somebody needs to shout with me on Sunday morning. Praise God. So we look in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, and it's interesting as God is talking to Abraham, which kind of started this whole ball rolling. I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. <laughs> Come on, that's, that's our father. That's our God. In hope, he believed, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had told as he'd been told, so shall your offspring be. God promised him an incredible nation. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. In other words, he did not consider his circumstances or his lack or his inability or him being unqualified or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's room, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. What promise has God given you? Don't waver. Don't waver. If God, listen, if God said it, he will surely bring to pass. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. So when your promise seems to elude you, what you need to do is lift your hands and praise him for the promise. Because as you praise him for those things that you do not see, believing that God is going to bring to pass what he has promised, you will strengthen yourself in your faith Amen. to believe for those things that do seem impossible with man, but still possible with God. I love this 21st verse. He was fully convinced. There was no ounce of doubt. He was fully convinced that God was able, set with me, that God was able to do what he had promised. Do you believe it? So I ask you again this morning. Are you fully convinced that your best days are ahead of you, that you can live under an open heaven, that you are the head, not the tail, that you are from above, not beneath, and that his blessing and his favor will literally chase you down and overtake you? What that says to me, even when I don't know how, which direction to run, God will chase me down. You know, we have three, three beautiful daughters that their DNA is, is their mother, and they're, they send me thank you cards all the time. And, but we had one of our daughters, two of them that was, they would love you, hop up in your life. I mean, they were just very loving. But we had one daughter that if we were going to get any loving, we had to chase her down and hold her down. 
just to get a kiss. Does anybody have a, a child like that? It's like they love you, but. And sometimes when I considered that daughter that literally ran from our affection, and yet we had so much affection to give her that we were literally chased through the house and overtake her to give her some sugar, that is the same picture of God with most of us. God running through our house. How I want shun them on country. Because he is so full of love for us that he doesn't know what to do with it except give it away. And so he will chase us down and hold us down to just give us some sugar. Somebody say sugar on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Amen. You're dismissed. I mean, that's as good as it gets. Amen. So you men that don't get enough sugar, tell your wives, you just need to be more like God. Chase me down and give me some sugar. And all the men said, that wasn't loud enough. All the men said, amen. That wasn't in the notes. So are you still convinced? Are you thoroughly convinced that miracles can happen? That sick bodies can be healed and heaven can take residence on earth right in the middle of who we are? Are you fully convinced that we can cross over and lay claim to our Canaan, to our land of promises? If so, we must come to understand the generation. Now listen, we must understand the generation that refused to be victims and fatalities in their wilderness, but boldly declared to their Lord and their leader. In Joshua chapter one, if you want to turn to Joshua, we're going to be there for the next few minutes. This is what they, and they answered Joshua, this generation, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. That is a far cry from their mamas and daddies generation. But this generation realizing that they did not want, listen, they did not want to be their father nor their mother because their moms and dads died in the wilderness and was buried in the desert sand. This generation said things must be different. So therefore they said, we will do whatever you ask us to do. And wherever you send us, we will go just as we obeyed Moses in all things. So we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. So I want to give you three things this morning in regard to understanding the, this Joshua generation that we must emulate, we must understand, and we must lean in the direction of. And first of all, this generation they were willing to take a risk. They were willing to take a risk. That's a lot easier for us to say than to do. You know when miracles usually happen? When if a miracle doesn't happen, you're done for. When are you at that point in your life when you've taken a risk? It's interesting to me that the fruit is usually on the end of the limb. Amen? This generation was willing to, cross, to take a risk. So the day of their crossing over, Joshua commanded the people in Joshua 3, if you're looking there, Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3, they're getting ready to cross over into the Canaan land. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it, talking to this Joshua generation. Yet there should be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits, about half a mile in length. Do not come near it in order that you may, in order that you may know the way you shall go. And listen, for you have not passed this way before. 
I want to tell you something, friends, where God wants to lead you is going to be virgin territory for you. And you're going to need to know that you know because you, you've never been there before. So you have no point of reference. You have no default, no preset because you have, you have never been there before. How many is willing to go wherever God would take you? Good demand the risk. The risk was simply this. They were going where they had never gone. They were seeing what they had never seen and they were living like they had never lived. That day they were willing to trade the only life they had ever known for a life they could only dream about. That day they were willing to walk away from the traditions of their father, listen, for the ultimate truth of the father. And that day they were willing to cross over their Jordan on the premise of a promise that God's not safe, but he is good. He's good. You know, an example, and I know I've I mentioned this several times through the years, but an example for our family as far as taking a risk was, was years ago, some 30 plus years ago, when God spoke to us, as we were associate pastor here with you, with Brother Brown at Abundant Life, and God spoke to us and said, I want you to go to a little small town in southwest Oklahoma and plant a church. And so we began to pray about it, seek the Lord fast, and, and just try to make sure we were clear about this. And so I reached out to one of my spiritual leaders, and I, and I asked him, what is your advice? Let me, let me just throw this out. There is wisdom in the, in the multitude of counselors, but at the end of the day, you have got to hear from God yourself. Because there are times that in the multitude, even of counselors, they've not heard what you're hearing. And they may be well-intentioned, but totally out of where God is wanting to take you. And they told me, they said, you're going to take your family, your three girls, down to that small town, and you're going to starve to death. Now, that was a truly tremendous, encouraging word. <laughs> because none of us want to starve, especially our kids. So the first Sunday that we started, we had some guests. But the people that were from Hobart, there were 13 that gathered. And five of them were ours. So do the math. But I, I can tell you that through those seven years that we were there, now listen, through those seven years that we were there, starting with nothing, n nothing but God, we experienced more miracles of God's intervention, God's protection, God's provision, more in those seven years than all of our 40 years combined in ministry. Why is that? because we were willing to live more outside the boat than in the boat. I'm just telling you, if you, are, if you are going to walk in places that God wants to lead you, you have got to be willing to become vulnerable. Will you live your life with no safety net and no plan B and no back door? That God is your, own, mm, that God is your only source of strength and provision and protection. And we left the church seven years later. The last Easter, we were shooting for 200. I told them if we, if we reach 200 people this morning, I will eat each Easter lunch on the, on, the, on the roof. We had 199. And one of the ladies was so upset. If I would have known that we just, we just need one more person, I would have gone to a nursing home and kidnapped an old lady. <laughs> and we, so we left that church with 199 our last Easter in a brand new facility because we were willing to take a risk. Amen? Truth is, we all need a miracle at one time or the other. The question is, are we willing to become a miracle? 
There's a difference between needing a miracle and becoming a miracle. Are you willing to take a risk and become a miracle and live more outside the boat than frozen fear gripping the oars, trying to survive the storm? Now, here's the deal, and I'm moving on. Here's the deal. When the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and the storm had arose, if Jesus would not have shown up, I believe that probably that boat, those disciples would not have survived. So they needed a miracle. Listen, they needed a miracle whether inside or outside the boat. So why not just be all in and just say, hey, the miracle's on the water. I'm heading in the direction of what I don't know, but I do know him. And he has never failed me nor forsaken me. How many know him? How many trust him? That he will never lead you where he cannot keep you and he can keep you anywhere. Because he's God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister Elizabeth Kinney, whoever she is, said this, and I love this quote. It's better to be a lion for a day than a sheep your whole life. (laughs) Roar! (laughs) Let your praises roar. Some of you, that psyched you out. Roar! I'd rather be a lion for a day. Come on now. Than a sheep for a lifetime. I'd rather die a lion than a sheep. Because here's the deal. If you die a lion, your legacy lives on. Because even when you die, they will stuff you and hang you on the wall. Somebody's wall. Right, Gary Loveless? But how many has ever seen any sheep hanging on the wall? It's alive or dead. You're better off to be a lion than a sheep. Amen. That wasn't the notes either. (laughs) Understand, a ship in harbor, in the harbor is safe, but that is not what ships were built for. So hear my heart today. I'm speaking to you as my family. You were not built for the harbor. You were built for the open seas. I challenge you, don't play it safe because there is no safety outside of walking in rhythm with God. Amen. Amen. You are not built for safety. You are built for discovery and you are not built for fear. You were built for faith. George Adair said, everything you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. If there is no risk, there is no reward. So I ask you, are you willing to risk believing when there's no apparent answer? Are you willing to risk stepping out when there's nothing under your feet? Are you willing to cross over when there's no guarantee but God? Amen. Are you? The second attribute of this generation was simply this. They were willing to share their faith. Notice in Joshua chapter four and verse one, and when all the nation had finished crossing or passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, this was God commanding them, saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, And bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And take each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. That this, now listen, that this may be a sign among you. And when your children... And your children's children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? 
Then you shall tell them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off so that these stones shall be the people of Israel, a memorial forever and ever and ever. And in verse 24, so that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So in other words, God was telling Israel, commanding Joshua to command these 12 men, let these stones, these 12 stones, listen, be a reference point to you to refer back to as a living testimony to your children and your children's children. In simplest terms, when your kids ask you in time to come, what do these stones mean? Why, why are these 12 stones stacked one on the other? You tell them, look what the Lord has done. He sealed my body. <laughs> He's touched my mind. And he saved me just in time. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he does it for me, he will do it for you. If he blessed this generation, he will bless the next generation because he is a God of all generations. You tell them what I did for you. You share your faith. So crossing over, listen to me, crossing over is you being willing to share your faith, to share what God has done in your life. Don't allow the miracle of your deliverance to die with you. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise again. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as a frontlet before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In that same chapter in verse 20, as Abraham is, I mean, as Moses is speaking, listen, and when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? You shall say to your son, we were once Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our very eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statues to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. That generation was willing to share their faith. I want you to understand God's greatest advertisement in this world is you. And your greatest story is your testimony. Anybody here have a testimony? How many was lost, but he found you? Yes. How many was blind, but you see? Right. How many was headed for hell, but now you are destined for the throne? Yes. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise because of his faithfulness to you. <laughs> you all have a story. You all have a testimony. Amen. Amen. You know, I love how Pastor Josh shares his testimony, his faith. One of the first things that we did to kind of bond when he first arrived was we went to an OU game. One that I figured we would win. Wasn't totally sure these days, but I took him to one. And so we were up on the upper deck. And so to get down, we needed to leave. We had to ride an elevator. And so we were the last two guys that squeezed in on the elevator. You know how elevators, elevators can be really uncomfortable. You don't know where to look. You don't know what to do with your hands. You don't, know, you don't know if you should hum or talk to yourself or talk to anybody or not talk to anybody. And everybody just kind of like froze in space. How many understand what I'm talking about? I hate elevators. I would almost rather walk steps, almost. And so we were on the elevator. And so I, 
I backed in, you know, all the, I mean, it's, it's big, a lot of river crowd. And Pastor Josh, didn't know Josh, got to know Josh right away that day. He stepped in facing everybody. <laughs> and said, hey, I'm Pastor Josh. This is my pastor, Pastor Craig Dacus. I'm going, <sighs> Josh, this is an OU game, okay? Come on. And he said, just want you to know that we have a great church on 89th of May. Service starts at 10 o'clock. We'd love for all of you to come. Our pastor's a great preacher. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, oh, come on. <laughs> now that's not exactly what all those people did on the elevator. And just looked at Josh like, is that catching and so last week we were, we were together at a conference in Dallas and we went to a, a great Mexican restaurant. <laughs> it was so funny. I was just waiting for it to happen. And so the, they had this real nice little waitress. She's taking good care. So she came up from the very beginning. And so Josh just leaned up after giving her order and he said, do you know Jesus? I mean, just like cold turkey. <laughs> I'll take a, I'll take a, what'd you, what'd you have? I'll take an enchilada with extra meat and extra cheese and extra beans and go ahead and wrap it with two enchilada shells. I mean, Josh gets in. I mean, he loves his food. Amen. And so after he gave her his order, he's like, yes, do you know Jesus? And she said, yes, he works in the kitchen. <laughs> And I was thinking, no, not Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> it was a classic, man. Where do you go with that? I'll take extra salsa. <laughs> but I love that because, you know, we don't need to be ashamed. We, the, the, listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the power of God unto salvation. And they won't know unless we tell them. And we have the answer to every question. We have the solution to every problem. And his name is Jesus. Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And who knows? Jesus may have had a shift in the kitchen that day. I don't know. <laughs> that was so boom. That was so good. So let me kind of try to wrap this up because I have more here, but... It's, it's so good. I'll come back. The third, give me 10 minutes. The third attribute of this generation was simply that they were willing to covenant. Now, I'm prepared for it to get quiet here this morning. But this is a spiritual truth that we must hear and we must know and we must understand. If we are going to grow in grace, and if we are going to cross over, you, you, must, you must figure this out. This generation was willing to covenant with God. They were, they were people willing to make a covenant with God, simply saying, you can count on us. We are in total agreement with you. We are in league on the same page, with, in stride, in sync with God, with God. That takes prayer, that takes fasting, that takes self-denial. Amen. You gotta get rid of yourself before you can really embrace the Savior. Covenant in the Hebrew means an alliance, a pact, a bond, a treaty. So before Israel marched on Canaan, listen, before they even dealt with Jericho, the first thing that God did after they built this monument out of the 12 stones out of Jordan, the very next thing that God required Israel to do was to be involved in a blood covenant. Before they marched one step in the direction of Jericho, their promised land, God said, you've got to take care of first things first. Because if you don't take care of this, I won't take care of that. Are you listening? 
Turn with me to Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. You need to see this. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, my alliance, my pact, my bond, my treaty, and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be a sign. Circumcision will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not even your, your own offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Now understand, this physical covenant was, was made with the Jewish people under law, God's law. In my opinion, we are under grace. So the physical covenant, I don't believe, is something that, but I do believe in the spiritual covenant, that it remains the same, be it law or grace. How many, how many know that 10 commandments came under the law? How many believe that, that the 10 commandments are still relevant under grace? There are some things that supersede the law that are enveloped into grace. Does that make sense? Yes. Verse 14, any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be, listen, will be cut off from his people for he has broken my covenant. I want you to watch this. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. God's covenant, God's bond, God's pact with man dealt with his flesh. Listen, God will never be in treaty with you until you have first dealt with your flesh. God will not bless that which is soiled by the flesh. I don't care what the religious world or the world is trying to feed you. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. And touch not the unclean thing. Amen. You, you cannot do what the flesh dictates and expect to walk under an open heaven and receive the blessing of God, nor to make heaven. I'm, just, I'm telling you, friends, with God, there is black and white. There's no gray. I was prepared for this silence. Why deal with the flesh? Romans 8 and 5, Paul said, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh, listen to this, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are, who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Cannot. Amen. This is why we need an old-fashioned revival. With salty tears of repentance on the altar of God again. Because this generation, we just want to do our thing and, let's, and let God bless us. We want, to, we want to somehow figure out a compromise. I can, I can just live my life loose and expect God to bless me. It doesn't work that way, friends. It never has. It never will. I, th I thought it was interesting. The song they sang this morning came out of Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah cried out, I see the Lord. It's interesting to me when he caught a glimpse of God what happened? An angel, an angel came from heaven with a coal 
from off the altar and touched his lip and cleansed him of his sin. You may see God, but you will never know God until you deal with the flesh, your carnal desires. We need an angel to come from God and once again cleanse us from the inside out that we may live holy hands unto God, that which is pleasing and acceptable in his sight. This is my last message for 30 days. You need to stay with me because I'm not through yet. This, this is, okay. So fast forward to Israel and they're crossing over. Joshua chapter five, verse two. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make, make flint knives and circumcise the Israel, Israelites again. Again, they had already circumcised the first generation but not the second. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. This is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age died in the wilderness on their way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised. The Moses generation, circumcised. But all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. And the Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who are of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they should not see the land. He had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place. Listen, God will stu- still do that today. If we won't get on board, he will find some sons. That he, he will have a church. So he raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had, they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. And then they went and conquered Jericho. I know this is a delicate subject, but has a deep, powerful, spiritual truth to us. Circumcision is defined as cutting off or cutting away. Circumcision is a surgical cutting away of the foreskin of a man's privates. That's what it is. And there are two medical advantages that God knew full well about. Number one, circumcision promotes hygiene and health. Come to find out, circumcised infants are less likely to develop urinary tract infection or UTI. Those uncircumcised infants are 10 times more likely to be infected. And there's much more medically that you can, you can study. The second being circumcision promotes sensitivity. I want you to think about this on a spiritual level. Those of us who have been spiritually circumcised, those who have allowed God and his word to cut away the unwanted and the unwelcome flesh, we live lives that are cleaner and more sensitive to the spirit of almighty God. Circumcision is also defined as to destroy Listen to what Moses said to his generation, Deuteronomy 10. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Stubborn, rebellious anymore. Apostle Paul comes along under grace, under grace, and declares, in him you are also, in Christ, listen, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands, but by God's hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. I believe that water baptism is more than just symbolic. As you are buried with him in baptism, what is it? You are dying to yourself. There is a spiritual declaration that you are placing the flesh 
under his control to destroy and cut away and remove at his pleasure so you may live your life pleasing, upright, and honest before God. Listen, our churches are not getting this message. We are preaching messages that tickle the ears and welcome and we're so seeker friendly that we have spurned the Holy Spirit of God. We need to get back. We lift holy hands to God and he is welcome because of holiness unto God. It still works. God still demands it. He hasn't changed his mind. I'm wrapping it up. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. But he has taken it away, nailing it to his cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So as we live and breathe, we are a walking testimony, a walking billboard of God's power and his grace and his mercy. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He has saved me just in time. Somebody shout amen on Sunday morning. Glory to God. So please understand this morning. God will never be in treaty with us. Will never be in alliance with us. Will never covenant with us until we have dealt with our flesh. And what nobody sees in you, God sees. God sees. Every thought you think, every action you're involved in, behind closed doors, after dark, God sees. That's why I love Joseph so much because when he was there in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife was seducing him every day, day by day. And finally there, she tried to seduce him to go to bed with her. And as he fled the scene, he cried out to God. And this is what he said, I cannot commit this great evil against my God. His mama, his daddy wasn't there. His brothers weren't there. Potiphar wasn't there. There was nobody there except him and the temptation. But he loved God so much that he said, I cannot commit this sin against my God. God give us that kind of relationship that when no, that's what integrity is all about. Doing what's right when no one's watching. That is spiritual integrity. I will not commit this great evil against the God that has redeemed me and rescued me and invested so much in me. Amen. Amen. (sighs) Covenant is all about relationship. It's all about intimacy. It's all about love. And the Bible makes it clear in Psalms 24, for who may ascend the mountain of the Lord. Who may stand in his holy place? And God, I want that. (laughs) Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? And the answer is the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swell by a false God. They clean hands and a pure heart, will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Just one or two more things. And I want you to hear this with your heart. Because I thought this was interesting. God, listen, God allowed Israel to cross over with covenant issues. But he would not let them conquer their Canaan until they dealt with covenant issues. His love will allow you to go so far. 
He'll bless you. He'll have mercy on you. But listen, you will never walk in destiny. You will never walk in fullness. You will never walk in favor until you deal with covenant issues, the circumcision of the heart. He let them cross over with, circum, with covenant issues. They were uncircumcised, but he would not let them. He would not let them move into their promise, move into their promise, move into their dream, move into their destiny until they dealt with their flesh. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. And here's the kingdom reward for doing business God's way. Joshua 5, 9, right down. And then the Lord said, I love this, that same chapter, same breath of anointing. And then the Lord said to Joshua, because you've circumcised this generation, today I have rolled away the reproach or the shame of Egypt. If you will make covenant with God, clean hands and pure heart, God will roll away every sin, every stain, every approach, every shame in your life. And you'll walk in freedom and joy, blessed and anointed of God as his son, as his daughter. Hey man, who wants that? We all want that. So that day, that very day, God rolled the reproach and shame of Egypt from them. And the very next day, now listen, the very next day in the 10th verse, and on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while encamped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites, the circumcised Israelites, celebrate the Passover. And the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. And the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. <laughs> they ate the fruit of their promised land. Salvations, healings, deliverances, prodigals coming home to the Father's house. Joy, peace, forgiveness. They ate the fruit of the land. Anybody here ready to eat the fruit of the promised land? Father, in Jesus' name, I commit this word in the hearts of your people. I've shared with them what you have burned into my heart as divine truth. And this morning, we give you permission to cut away, to destroy the works of the flesh. All malice, all unforgiveness, all bitterness, all lust, all lewdness. Anything that would shadow grace, anything that would stain mercy, anything that would bring displeasure and embarrassment to your name, God, we give you permission to cut it away, to destroy it. And let the water of your word wash us clean and the blood of Jesus cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we may stand as people approved by God, eating the fruit of the land, blessed and highly favored of God. Ugh. In Jesus' name. I'd like you to stand across this auditorium this morning. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm gonna give you a simple challenge. And really the choice is yours, it's always been yours. When you stand before God, I want you to hear this, the choice will no longer be yours. The choice will be God's. It pays eternal dividends to get the choice right now so you can enjoy God's choice later. But you're in this building this morning and there's some flesh in your life 
you know it's there. You know it's there. You've tried to justify it. You've tried to live with it. You've tried to excuse it. But this morning, the Holy Spirit has dealt with you as at other times. And he's saying to you, if you'll come to me this morning, I'll begin a work of restitution. I'll begin to cut away the flesh, not with human hands, but with loving hands to forgive you, to restore you, to renew you, to remake you, to rewire you. And that is you in this building, you need God to forgive you of some flesh in your life. I want you to come right now and stand and kneel across the front of this building. I'm going to pray over you and then I'm going to dismiss you as you come right now. I've got some flesh that I need to deal with. I've got some flesh that God has dealt with me in days gone by. I've allowed it to live. I've allowed it to reside in my house. Matter of fact, I've even fed that flesh by my own desires. But this morning, I want more than anything to stand pleasing and acceptable before God. I want him to cut away the flesh. Forgive me my sins. Wash me clean. How many more will come? Are you kidding me? In a, in a church of 400 people, there's only eight people, nine people that has flesh to deal with. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit, guys. Listen, you'll not move on. You'll not move forward until you've dealt with your flesh. God is reaching out to you in this service through his word and through his spirit. He's not kidding. This is not just another message. This is God's message for his people at this moment in time. And his mercy is here today. As you come, praise God. Sing, come as they sing. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loose. Yes, 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 God. God, we believe. Yes. Yes, we can see. Yes, God. Wonders are still what you do. Do work in us, God. Do work in us, Jesus. We are here for you. Praise God. Come and do what you do. Listen to the Holy Spirit this morning. We are here for Obey, you. Obey what God is saying to you this morning. Come and do. Don't what hold back. Don't you hang do. back. Lean into him this Set morning. Lean in the direction of God's love. Yes, you. God. Yes, God. Come and do what you do. Because we need a move. Because we need a move. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over these that have responded. You see their heart. You hear their cry. You understand the stronghold that's in their life. And you love them. And you have anointed me to preach this word, to bring truth that you might set them free in the power of your word. And so right now in Jesus' name, I come against every stronghold of the enemy, every temptation of hell, every work of the flesh and in the name of Jesus and by the power that is in the blood of Christ we rebuke these attacks God as they submit and surrender to the will of God as they repent before you of their sins God you are faithful and just to forgive us from all of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and God in a moment's time at an altar here in Bethesda this morning. I pray, God, that they'll be radically changed, that you would cut away and destroy the works of the flesh. God, that they walk in victory and power. Give them the Word of God to stand upon, to live their lives by reason of God. Let the power of the Holy Spirit flow through their spiritual veins, God, to live the life that you deserve and the life that they desire. God, I bless them physically and mentally and emotionally. The 
most of all, I bless them spiritually. Satan, you have no hold here. You have no right here. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the power of the word and the power of your blood. So God set the captive free and may we walk out of this place a new creature in Christ Jesus because of the living word of God, the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've come, lift your hands, begin to praise him. You've come repenting, lift your hands, begin to thank God for his love and his forgiveness and his mercy. Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, God, yes, God. Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. We believe, we believe, oh God. We are crossing over, God. We are crossing over, Jesus. We are crossing over, God. Yes, yes, God. God, we Yes, 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 God. Come on, sing that again. Hallelujah, yes. Bodies are still being. Yes, God, heal us. Deliver us. Give us in the name of Jesus. Yes, God.
It's renewed, restoring, saving and healing, delivering captives, setting us free. It is life everlasting for all who receive it, your blood. sins like the blood of Jesus to renew, to restore can we give all those a hand this morning that came down to say Lord I want more of you I want more of you Lord I want to do this before we dismiss just stay with me just a minute Pastor and Miss Vicki would you just come down here I want to pray over them that this next 30 days is going to be such a refreshing time and a restoring time and they pour and they pour, they squeeze that sponge, they squeeze it, they squeeze it, they squeeze it. And sometimes it's good just to go and say, okay, Lord, we're going to catch our breath and we're going to let you do what you do best. Pastor Brown, I want you to come. Pastor Brown's going to pray over them. And I just want you to, to, just to stretch a hand and just agree one with another that God's going to do some great things. It's going to be a wonderful time of refreshing. Amen. Pastor Brown, would you come and pray over our pastors today? that God would refresh them. Father God, we're bound our hearts together before you with our pastors, those who have led us through deep waters and through winding paths, but have remained faithful in every circumstance, in every situation. We're praying now this morning, Lord, that your presence will continue to rest upon you. Your anointing, your refreshing. And Father God, you understand and you know all things. You know the needs. And Father, you're able. You promised in your word, your covenant keeping God, that what you have said, not only are you capable of performing, but you desire to do so for those who put their trust in you and who love you. And so we pray for Brother and Sister Dacus, Lord, that there will be a special presence 
that accompanies with them day by day, hour by hour. Lord, that there will be a consciousness and awareness of your nearness as you minister unto them, Lord, as they have ministered unto us. And Father, we'll give you praise for we're asking it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Give him praise for it. Amen. God's going to do some wonderful things. Amen. Uh, Pastor, if you would if you would hang here just for a moment, uh, Miss Vicky, you can stay too. You were part of raising this one. You said he's an adolescent now. Is that, that, that what we're getting there? The year was 1954. Did you know a new house back then cost $10,250? Bring it back, Lord. Bring it back. Do you know rent was about $85 a month? Yeah. Gas was 22 cents a gallon on average. Praise the Lord. I feel revival. A new car cost about $1,700. The president of the time was Dwight D. Eisenhower. In the name of Jesus. Show, there he is. Sports Illustrated's first issue came out in 1954. Rock Around the Clock was the number one song of the year. Come on, somebody. Elvis Presley began his career in 1954. The film, Miss Vicki, you'll like this. The number one film of the year was White Christmas. Yes. You know, you also in 1954, someone else was born that year. Can somebody tell me who this is? Yeah, oh, I mean, your twin, John Travolta. The Rose Bowl was first televised in color that year. Yes, Michigan State beat UCLA that year. That's a good year. And though, get this, get this. I'll bring you a little spiritual tie to all this. The word under God was added to the Pledge of Allegiance that year, 1954. <laughs> 65 years. And still going strong for Jesus. And we just have a card. We want to say thank you for your dedication, Miss Vicki's dedication. And there's a little collage for you of the family from from the days. But um, we just pray that there's a blessing. There's also a table out front for you that people have brought gifts and cards to shower you. Um, They want to help you do that AARP copay. They wanted to help you with that. Uh, There's also some Golden Corral. You can get the discount today. Things are looking up. Amen. But we do love our pastors. Can we give them a great hand? Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness. Love you.